Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Christina Linden, and I'm the Director of Academic and Public Programs here at the Cantor Arts Center, and I want to welcome, welcome you to this evening's program. Um, and before we continue, I would like to acknowledge that Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Mwekme Ohlone tribe. Stanford sits on the ancestral lands of the Mwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. Tonight's program celebrates the exhibition Morris Hirschfield Rediscovered, which is now on view through January 21st, 2024. This is the first retrospective of Hirschfield, who was a self-taught artist in over 75 years. Hirschfield was a Jewish immigrant who lived in Brooklyn and was propelled to fame in the early 1940s by the New York avant-garde after a 40-year career in the garment industry and slipper making business. We are delighted to have this rare opportunity to hear stories and insights about Hirschfield's life from Robert Dennis Rensler, a lawyer and the ex executor of the estate of Morris Hirschfield, also Hirschfield's grandson. Robert will be joined in conversation with Richard Meyer, who curated the exhibition. Um, and the exhibition itself was previously on view at the American Folk Art Museum in New York. Richard is the Robert and Ruth Halperin Professor in Art History here at Stanford University, where he teaches courses in 20th century American art, the history of photography, arts censorship and the First Amendment, curatorial practice, and gender and sexuality studies. We also have available today Richard's book, Master of the Two Left Feet, Morris Hirschfield Rediscovered, which was awarded the 2023 Daedalus Foundation Award for Outstanding Exhibition Catalog. If you have a copy and it's not yet signed, there will be a book signing after the conversation this evening. Um, and we also have copies of the book for sale out in the front lobby. Uh, and those will be for sale again after the program if you'd like one. And we will also have time for questions from the audience after the conversation. So um, if you'd like to ask a question at that point, please raise your hand. We'll bring around a microphone and hand that to you. We're recording this, um, this event tonight. So it helps if you wait for the microphone because then the question also um, makes it onto the recording. Thank you again all for being here. And thank you, Richard and Robert. We're really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, we, I'm very um, grateful that Bob and his wife, Gail, have um, come to Stanford. Uh, to see the exhibition and to for Bob to talk with me here at the museum and to share with all of you um, some things that only he knows. Uh, <laughs> and you know that um, Bob is the only person that I spoke to who was ever in the presence of Morris Hirschfield. Um, and of course, being someone's grandson is a special kind of presence to, to, to have and for that person to have in your life. And um, Bob was six or seven years old when, uh, when Hirschfield died. And it's incredible to me how much he remembers. Um, all I remember from before I was six years old is going once to the laundromat with my mother. And, but he remembers an incredible amount. So uh, on that note, Bob, I want to well, ask you. I, I also went with my mother, only it was to a beauty parlor where I had to sit for hours on end. It takes a while. It takes a, sometimes playing a while. with the Bobby plins that were on the floor. <laughs> um, so good. We both have mother memories from early from early on. 
But you have other memories also, and I want to ask you, I think I'm going to start with, as you know, my favorite story that you've told me about your grandfather, which, which begins with your dog. So tell us about Sultan, Sultana Sharon of Blue Blood, starting with that name. Richard, I'm not ignoring you, but no, you no, have please. to turn this way so they can hear me on this side of the room and that side of the room. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to unclick this. I, are you allowed and everyone, to? Right. if I'm not allowed to, they'll throw me out. <laughs> okay. Um, the dog was our family dog. More accurately, it was my sister's dog, Sharon. Uh, she wanted a dog. My dad did not want a dog. We lived in a very small apartment in a an apartment building in Brooklyn. And having a dog wasn't really very practical. But she was after him, and he refused to give her the money to buy it. And so she magically found $100. She claimed it was on the floor somewhere. We got the dog, and the dog was in a pedigree. So it had to have a pedigree name. And it came from a line of dogs that were named Blue Blood. So you're looking at Sultana, Sharon, sister of blue blood and it was as much my dog as it was hers and uh, I guess you really want to hear about how the dog came into yes but, the, the at first, but first I want to hear about how Sultana became Sultan well yeah Sultana was an awkward name the dog was a female so uh, Sultana became Sultan which is quick and easy to pronounce Sultan come and Sultan came or Frequently, Sultan, go find Dennis, because Dennis, which is me, would hide in the house, and Sultan would have to run around to find me, and then to hear the screams, you found Dennis, good doggy. So that's the story about Sultan. Whereas I say Sultana made a transition. Yes, and then I reported, <laughs> when you said that earlier today, I said, this is not of throwback to right. today right. where sultanas can become sultans and vice versa. Right. This was back and, and in the 1940s all... yes. when sex remained the sex it was. Well, except a name. Anyway, so a name. you could yes. change yeah, the gender. Yes. Okay. Okay. okay, so now, um, first of all, I don't know about you, I had never heard of this thing of naming, like the, the purebred dog had to have three names. I, I didn't, the story didn't make any sense to me in the beginning. But then Bob Slow, you know, you were very patient and you explained this thing. And then there was the name change. But okay, I got on board with it. But now tell us what happened next. Okay. This is what you want to hear and this well, is what everybody should know. Um, my grandfather had started painting and I was aware of it as a very young boy that he was starting to do painting. That was a hobby for him before he was, quote, discovered. So <clears throat> I felt that he should paint a painting for me. I mean, I was his grandson. And so I said, Grandpa, will you paint a painting for me? And he certainly agreed quickly and asked me, what do you want a painting of? And I had no idea what I wanted a painting of. I just wanted him to paint something for me. So out of nowhere, I said, I paint my dog. Paint a picture of Sultan. So in his mind, he painted a picture of Sultan. I guess, Richard, this might be the point where you show the god-awful painting I got when I was six. I hated it. What kind of a world is there a paisley print dog? And the insult was tripled because he didn't just paint my dog, he painted two more monsters below my dog. I hated the oil. I didn't appreciate it then until later in life. And when I turned 17, since I did not appreciate the oil and was offended by it, uh, I sold it. My mom gave me permission and I sold it to get a car, which I came, of course, to regret, not because of his fame, but because it's signed to my loving grandson, Dennis. And here it was in a stranger's house. And I wanted it back. Uh, we took a, a trip to Manhattan from Brooklyn on the train, subway train. And in doing that, 
Janice bought it from me, which was illegal. I was a minor at the time, and he was wise enough to know that someday I would regret it. So he quickly disposed of it by selling it to a bona fide purchaser for value. As an attorney, I can tell you, that cut off my rights as a minor. I was out of luck. I could not void the sale, which I would have done. And I began a correspondence with the buyer, a lady named uh, Lattice, who we, I got friendly with eventually. And that exchange went on for, honey, how long? About, this is my wife, Gail. About 55 years, <laughs> begging her. And until her husband passed away, God bless him, and she wanted to send her daughter to college, did she finally relent and say, well, I need money for college. I'll sell it to you now. And we agreed on a price, and we agreed on a date. And the date happened to be, and I was looking forward to this. I can't tell you how. I kept telling her, that's my name on it. It says to my loving grandson, Dennis, every time you look at it, you'll know it's mine. It belongs to me. It should be with me. So we set up a meeting. We set up a dinner meeting. I was in California. She was in New York. And we set up a dinner meeting one week before and in the top floor of the restaurant in the Twin Towers. Of course, the Twin Towers was destroyed before the meeting took place. The meeting was to be a week after the Twin Towers disaster. So I had to bide my time, wondering if she was going to change her mind, which she didn't. And finally, I took a drive with my son, uh, and we packed a suitcase with the money. We drove to New York, bought the oil from her, and drove back with the oil, stopping, you know, every couple of days. Back in those days, you didn't do New York in two days. It was like a five-day trip, I think. And uh, every evening, that oil was taken out of the car up to the room where my son and I slept so that I wouldn't risk losing it, which I apologize to everyone isn't here. But I will tell you, it wasn't in New York either. It was not on display for either exhibit. And that's because I refused to have it shipped out of my presence. I was never going to lose possession of it again until the day I die. And my wife has agreed that we, uh, we set up a family trust. That oil goes to my son, who made the drive. Our other son has six birds, which was left to me by my nephew, Spencer, my sister's son. So two oils remain in our family, although at one time, we had an abundance of oils uh, hanging on the wall. My oils hung in my grandparents' house, and some hung in our house. I say house, apartment. My grandparents, although at one time they did have a, a mansion, I understand, uh, he lost everything to some partners, if you want to call them them. My wife, my mother called them thieves, uh, and he ended up in a modest apartment in Brooklyn, one block from where we live. So one of the things that I love about that story is the painting didn't change from the one that Bob hated because it didn't resemble his dog, at least didn't resemble his dog in any realistic fashion. But he cha Bob changed. And so years later, not only did he want the painting back, but he spent much of, you spent much of your life working to get that painting back. And then, I hope you don't mind me saying, Gail and Bob took out a second mortgage in order to have the money because it was, I don't know the exact amount, I don't need to know, but it was quite a sum um, for them. Well, I promised Lattice I would not you know. tell the sum, that was her business, but uh, I will say that it was an obscene amount and uh, someone once told me, you didn't pay too much, you just bought it too soon. I don't, I don't get it, sorry. You don't get it? The value went up, Richard. Oh, since then. That's why I was told I bought it too soon. I paid a lot for it, but eventually it was worth more than I paid. 
Right, but if you then waited to buy it later, it would cost more. That's why I bought it too soon. But anyway, mind. okay. <laughs> the book is finished. The exhibition is finished. So I don't have to get all of, you know. Your Everybody else gets it. Right. <laughs> so, but what I want to ask Bob is, do you see now? Because the painting doesn't, the, the creatures, the dog wolf horses, they don't look anything more like Sultan than they did when you were six. So what is it about the painting that you decided, in addition to, I think there's more maybe than the inscription, about the formal aspect of the painting that you decided you wanted or you had to have back? I don't know that there is more. I mean, I love the painting. Uh, I, I acquired it really before my grandfather's fame, so to speak. Uh, it wasn't acquired as a result of his fame. I wanted it back you know, as soon as I matured. And what I see is, I guess, a quest fulfilled. And it's, it, it's my grandfather. It's his handwriting on it. It's his message to me. And now it belongs with me where it should have been all the time. So what, we, what I have said before, um, I think you've said this in your own way, in fact, earlier today, perhaps, but <laughs> which is I think that also you see the force of his imagination. That oh, he's course. not interested in a realism where the painting resembles the material world as we know it. But to me, this seems like, okay, here's my grandfather's spirit in a sense. Well, that's how he saw right. my dog. Not when he saw my dog. I was over there frequently with my dog. I used to visit him often. So uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, uh, what I see in that is what my grandfather saw when he went to the canvas to paint my dog. Yeah. That's what he saw in his mind's eye. And that was his impression of what the dog should look like in the, in the painting. And I just, I don't know if I've told you this, but it's probably implicit or in the, from the book and the show. I felt when I first saw Hirschfeld that his imagination on canvas the way he translated it to canvas, it didn't look like anything else, like any other artist that I had seen. So I think that there's, and he wasn't working in dialogue with other artists or really with, with anyone. Um, it seemed, I mean, in terms of the choices he made creatively, they were his own. Of course, there was nobody else standing over his shoulder when he was doing the painting. The only person standing over his shoulder was his own mind's eye and seeing on the canvas and on the sketches that he made uh, his impression of what would end up the final result. Yeah, and so when, when um, Bob said Janice, he's referring to Sidney Janice, who went on to become one of the most successful art dealers in the world, and he was the person who discovered Morris Hirschfeld uh, as an and helped promote him and sort of shape him into uh, an artist with a capital A, I guess you could say. He then lost, Hirschfeld lost that capital A after his death in the sense that um, he was largely, his work was largely forgotten until, until now, we hope. Um, so let's, I want to ask you about, I'm showing um, here two drawings. They're not in the show. But um, just so you get every single painting that Bob's grandfather made, he made a full-scale drawing, a pencil study. That's extremely unusual that you would make a study, the actual size of the finished work. And we've talked about, and I've tried to figure out, were these transferred to the canvas, which I don't think they were in any carbon copy or um, projected way. But it's still not clear to anybody what, how exactly the drawing, how Hirschfeld moved from drawing to painting. But what I want to point out, and that's Rabbi on the right, and we still have not located. There are several Hirschfeld paintings. We don't know where they are, if they still exist. And that stage beauty is a great uh, Hirschfeld that's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And so here, though, on the bottom of both of these um, is an inscription that says, Ori Original Morris Hirschfeld sketch, Rabbi, the title, Hannah Hirschfeld-Renser, which is Bob's mother, 
Hirschfeld's daughter, who was also, as I understand, one of the only, if not the only, believer in the importance of his art. My and mother. Your mother speaking, yeah. in the family. But I want you to explain why your grandmother, I'm sorry, why your mother's name is on the, these drawings. Please. Well, apparently I, it was a faux pas on my part. <laughs> Um, I direct, just like moving the mic was a faux pas. And again, Christine, I'm so sorry if I messed up the, bird, the beginning. Thank you again. Thank you again. Uh, I uh, had acquired the, the, uh, the, the sketches uh, when I was in New York on a trip. And my mother escorted me down to the basement where they were because they had been set aside in, in Brooklyn, New York, and in. Uh, below the house below the apartment they lived in, and when you're saying in- A what? barrel, I'm trying to- I'm, Oh yeah, I'm they, were, you. They, were in a, they were in a barrel. Uh, yeah, and they were going to be ultimately, I think, discarded because it was in a common basement. It was, it was a, an, a, not a high rise apartment building. There may have been two or three apartments downstairs and it was an upstairs with an equal number of apartments. So it was in a basement that had common basically throw away goods that weren't thrown away. And uh, when my mother mentioned to me that they were there, we discussed her taking me down to the basement so I could get them, which I did. I brought them back. Gail, my wife, was with me when I asked my mom to sign them because I felt they, they should be preserved as to the fact that they were original Morris Hirschfields and not somebody who came along and did sketches that resembled the oils. So I instructed her how to sign it uh, to indicate on the left it was an original Morris Hirschfeld sketch in the middle of the name. And by the way, she named all these oils. Every one were named by her. Janice changed some names, but they were originally named by her. And to the right, sign her name. So that's how all of them came to be done. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, my faux pas was how I directed her in the signing of them. Which you said sign them. I said, do that what you're doing. And I had her do it on the front. I had a friend in the world of art who I told all about it and he came over to see them, a doctor friend of ours. And he said, you messed up. Why? You know, this proves that, he said, no, no, that's not it. You should have had her do that on the back side, because now, you know, she's not the person who drew those sketches, and so it's misleading, and it doesn't belong there, and it takes away from the sketch. But I didn't do it for the value of the sketch. It was going to be mine, and I did it simply to have it proven that any others were not original, at least any of these. Janice somehow acquired some sketches, which therefore are not authenticated in any way. Not on the front, not on the back, not on the top, not upside right. down. There's nothing on them except the sketch itself. In including the elephant, sketch of elephant that we have upstairs. Um, so the first time I went to Ron, Ron? Oh, see. I don't know. Bob. <laughs> the first time you went and ran to Bob's house. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was trying to say Bob and Gail. It's about how it came out wrong. I don't know what happened. But anyway, the first time I went to Bob and Gail's house in Tarzana in 2015. That's not really relevant. But anyway, and I saw these drawings. I was very disarmed or disoriented by this signing on the front. I was like, why is... Hannah Hirschfeld rents are signing these drawings. Um, and since then, I've completely um, changed my mind. And I'm, I'm, it is very moving to me that they're signed on the front because Hannah's name and who, the, the daughter who believed, the member of the family who believed in her father's work, who helped broker the sales of her father's work, who titled them, she inscribes her name. And to me, that becomes a dialogue between the father who made this, who didn't think of these drawings as art in any, you know, generally artists don't think of a preliminary study or a sketch as an artwork that's gonna be seen by the public. And 
I didn't actually know, I don't know how I didn't know this, that you had instructed her to do this. I thought it was her, your mom's thing, but it oh. actually makes the story even more complicated because it becomes a three generation dialogue. <laughs> um, and I don't know, I think that very often artists are so individualized and the context in which they work, the fa I'm, I, I don't want to glorify families here or you know, sentimentalize, but I feel like um, there's a way in which, to me, this just speaks of a, of a relationship where, first of all, authentication would be needed. Um, I, I mean, in the sense that I sort of think of it as the daughter saying, your mother, I'm sorry, saying, this is valuable, this is authentic, this is in the world, and I'm going to tell you what the title is, and that it's unique. And I don't know, to me, as an art historian, that's very moving. I'll leave you to the moving element. <laughs> to, me, to me, it was just a practical thing to do. I know, but practical things can also, you know. Yes, of course, of um, course. And so, okay, so I wanted to, <clears throat> I think one of, the, so Bob came to, um, my class, two of my classes today, earlier today, um, so he has a lot of stamina. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we talked about... A lot of tolerance to spend today with Richard. Yes, it did. <laughs> believe me, you can I love talk to man. my family. About I love you, Richard. Um, I love um, you. I do. But um, <laughs> I totally lost whatever I was going to say, so let's continue. <laughs> um, oh, this is just the painting. I just wanted you to see, I mean... So, so much of what makes Hirschfeld, I think, so visually dazzling, his work, has mm -hmm. to do with color and patterning and his love of geometry. I mean, if you look at the stage, um, if you just look at these incredible costumes and the color contrasts, um, and then there are probably about a thousand dots. I know they're a little hard to see here, but in hand-painted dots in the background. Backgrounds were just as important to, I believe, your grandfather as so-called foregrounds or center. Even though the drawing is of the three figures, the painting does not privilege. I don't, I mean, the figures also become these parts, like they're, you know, sausage dresses or whatever the, you know, the parasols, the headdresses, the um, I have no idea. Do you have any idea what those two tear-shaped things hanging down over the stage are? They're, we, Your imagination is as good as curtains. Curtains? Like, you know, stage girls would have a curtain, but they're not really curtains. Right. I mean, I can't look I can't, and then they have blossoms inside and leaves. So here's what, right. I think it's what Hirschfeld wanted in that space because the composition for him, remember he'd been in textiles, he, it, it's as though every part had to be, as it were, embroidered. And so, and then he, he sort of pieces it together. And those were pieces that he put in after, it seems, the drawing, as he's actually painting. It wouldn't look as good today. No. And I think it wouldn't look as good if they were recognizable easily as curtains or chandeliers. To me, it balances them. Gail saying to me it balances them. She doesn't have a mic, so... It would be good to repeat oh, I'm what sorry. she says. I can hear you, so I'm imagining. I'm sorry. Now she has a mic. Well, I was saying, I think the objects that hang down between the girls balances the picture. Without them, it would be too plain. Yeah, and maybe too horizontal. In certain, or it would just be, the, it would be more like the drawing, just the three figures sort of stuck, you know, perhaps. Um, as, as the only verticals. Now you have these two other tear-shaped verticals that have, anyway, that sort of. I think it kind of makes the painting. Yeah. Just like you have two dogs under the one main dog. <laughs> you had to fill out that oil and you had to fill out that canvas. It took me about seven years to learn, to figure this out, that like I shouldn't try to decipher each object in the painting. I should think of it as what he wanted in terms of pattern and color to fill that space, which is very different than I have to describe a chandelier or a curtain. Okay, so wait, so here's that, here's that. I'm going the wrong way, I'm sorry. This is a counterintuitive. Okay, so this is a book that I'm just gonna prompt you. I mean, this is just setting you up to say whatever you wanna say. 
Okay, so this is a book that, that Bob gave, a really interesting book called Our Living World. And this is a page from it. Um, so t t t t do you remember this book in your grandfather? I remember my mother giving me that book because it was an inspiration for his bird oils that he used. And in that book, there were, there were actual bookmarks that were his sketches, just tiny little bookmarks in pencil sketches uh, that resembled portions of the bird that he used to bookmark some of the birds, I guess, that turned into the ultimate oils. So I, I made that a gift to the American Folk Museum, Art Museum. The Folk Art Museum. And it's on display, Bob's copy or gift. It, it, the, the copy uh, that Hirschfield owned is on display with open to a page. And I have to give Vic, um, Veronica Roberts some props here. She's, she can't be with us today. But so we were trying to decide what page. You don't, I don't think you know this. We were trying to decide what page to show, you know, because we didn't want to show the same page that we showed. That's the problem with displaying a book. You just can show one page. And so we're looking through it. And there's a painting called Pheasants. So we looked up. I mean, this is this incredible compendium of three volumes with like e virtually every living creature in the world. And this second volume is all birds, any bird. All these birds I didn't know existed. They're all, you just look them up and, you know, in the index. And um, this is Plubber. But um, Veronica's looking through. We have this painting, which was in New York, called Pheasants. And she goes to the pheasants page, and there's a pheasant that looks sort of. I mean, of course, Hirschfeld completely reimagined it. But it vaguely looks like the pheasants in our um, show, the painting in our show. So then there's a, a courier, so a person who travels with the works from the home museum, and they're looking to make sure you, know, you don't mess anything up or you know, that you're treating everything properly. And we go, we say, well, we want this page, and we want to put one of the bookmarks in it. And she said to her, and this, and we had picked out a particular bookmark, and she said, this bookmark was in that page. I mean, out of six, seven hundred pages, Veronica chose the page, which was bookmarked by your grandfather with the most, we thought, the most interesting bookmark. So earlier today when I was shown that book, which is on display in the exhibit. And you could see the that book. story was explained to me. Oh, shoot. So I never saw so that who, bookmark. Who before. told you that story? I, I won't tell. Okay. I, that was my story. Anyway. Well, <laughs> everybody heard it here for the first time. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Except and uh, whoever told I didn't go through the various pages. There was one bookmark that always stood out from the book, and I didn't disturb it, right? and it was just a tiny sliver of the bookmark, and I left that in place, and when I donated the bookmark, I said, I believe there are other bookmarks in the book, but I wasn't going to turn 600 pages. Right. It was falling apart as it was. I had to rebind the spine with a special glue that they make for book spines, and before I donated it, so it wouldn't fall apart. and. Uh, now it sits here with the proper bookmark on the proper page. Yeah, oh, and so this is not the um, this is not the pheasants. This is actually a painting called "Birds on the Grass Too," and you have to go. I mean, you all, if you haven't seen the show, you have to see it, and then you should buy the book, of course. But um, uh, <laughs> um, this is the painting that was actually given to the Cantor on the occasion of the exhibition um, from the estate of um, Conrad and Maria Janus. So one of the two sons of, of Sidney Janus who discovered um, Hirschfeld. But what I'm showing you here is, um, I mean, the, the, the outline of the bird. And Josie Johnson, who's the head of um, education, no, the head of publications and exhibitions here, manager, I think. Yeah, anyway, she also worked with me as sort of internal curator on the Hirschfield Show. And she discovered, which I never knew, do you, that your grandfather used sten stencils is that, or cutouts for the birds. To, I do Josie, not know is that, that right? Thank you, Christina. Wow. Um, according to Janice, he writes that in one of his uh, Well, we about can't him. really believe. That's the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you could, but what, even if he, like, let's say he was using cutouts, it is the 
plumage and the patterning, that is, there is no bird in all of our living world, in all of, you know, of creation that has those colors and those patterns. And so that, is, and then also if you look at the way in which nature is exhibited, anyway, as uh, displayed in terms of the backdrop, again, it doesn't correspond to anything you could name. And that's... Well, nothing what, was cut out from the book. No, no, no. So I, the book oh, was intact. Yeah, no, so no, no. So if there were cutouts of any sort, you see, they would have been independently Maybe I thought made, they were but I never freehand. heard about. I never heard about cutouts till the word came up just now. I think he drew them himself and then used them to sort that of would, repeat across the canvas and flip and repeat from yeah. his sort of patterning practice. Yeah. Which you could sort of see if you look at these two birds on the left lower. I mean, they could have been from the same sort of cutout. I don't think it takes away from his wildly no. original and imaginative spirit, creative vision. Okay. Now, I just, before we open it up to questions and answers, which, Christina, we should do soon, right? Um, so we've got, we can talk for 10 more minutes. Okay. We'll be fine. I thought it would be interesting for you to see and for Bob to talk about um, some of the paintings that were in his home when he was growing up, including Moses and Aaron, so the first Old Testament painting, what, what I think of as a Jewish, I mean, Jewish-themed painting, very unusual depiction of Moses and Aaron, including the fact that there's two representations of the Ten Commandments, so there's 20 commandments, mm -hmm. um, and <coughs> the, just the incredible colors and patterns. I don't want to keep saying that, but... I will just, you've heard this, I'm sorry, but I'm going to say it quickly, which is I had a research assistant two years ago, an undergraduate, and one of her tasks was to count all of the stars in this painting. I felt bad about it, but then I'm like, why do I feel bad? She's a Stanford student, she's getting paid. You know, she can count stars. Anyway, um, and then what I think is interesting is that this painting, which is, Biblical would be in the same house as Coquette, which is the most, even though there are many nudes that I think are more eroticized in certain ways, this is the most explicitly seductive. Um, so I just am curious about growing up in a house. I'm curious if she uh, had a mental breakdown after counting the stars. <laughs> Did she bring a case against you, Richard? <laughs> Workers' compensation or something? I, gave, I let her pad the hours. I told her, oh, take a, you know, bill me for a couple extra hours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, so I'm asking, <laughs> yes, well, I'm right. asking you, sorry, about living in the, I just, I find this, but of course, that's looking at it with the eyes of the art historian. And one of the things that is important to remember is people live with art before it's in museums. And it becomes part of your everyday life in a way that, so I'm just wondering, like, this, if this seductive woman were on the walls in the house where I grew up, maybe I, I would have noticed well, it was in the house where Gail and I lived before we moved to Utah. Right. So it, you and Gail is still upset. Gail is saying that we walked up the stairs, and if she waits for a mic, you can all hear it. Wait, your boy Martin and Martin and Danny would we it hung at the bottom of the stairs in a, in a very large area because we had a two-story house, and uh, our boys saw it. Time they were born until, well, some of them never moved out, you know, but they, <laughs> until they were grown men. So they always saw coquette. I mean, yeah, I maybe like the most, um, in a way, like it's hard to think of Hirschfeld's paintings, including this one, as they don't seem to be overtly sexual, in part because they're so sort of. Friendly in a way that doesn't seem fully well, well, viewed. Viewed had flowers covering all the private areas, so I don't think who did he, the view painting. Oh, I thought you said you that I. No, I didn't anyway. accuse. <laughs> I didn't accuse you of covering your <laughs> right. private areas. Anyways, <laughs> with flowers that wouldn't be bad. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so tell everybody well, about Aaron, this painting. Oh, Moses sorry. Moses and Aaron hung in the. Uh, in the living room of my parents' house when right. I grew up. Right. And I still have the study, the sketch, which hangs, it hung behind a couch in our living room in Brooklyn. I have 
the study of Moses and Aaron, the exact same right. one. The pencil. And that hangs in our home uh, behind a couch now. So uh, it's the closest I come to yeah. having it. Well, so I do want, before we run out of, or before we go to Q&A, I want um, you to tell uh, everybody about this painting uh, well, in your you, life. Okay, I am theorizing because this is 1945. And I know my grandfather presented that to me when I was a child, but told me I was too young to have a picture of a naked lady. So my Aunt June put it away in the basement for me. It's 1945, and I think, and I, I'm guessing, that was his way to apologize to me for painting the dog oil that Back, I, I, I hated it, and he knew I hated it, and I think that was his way of, of making it up to me because he made a gift of you to me, but I couldn't have it until I got to be, you know, mature and older. So I did end up with you, and eventually, cost of living being what it is, and we were not wealthy, it had to get sold, it was sold, and the gal who bought it, through the uh, gallery, Saint gallery, Jane Collier, Saint yeah, Saint gallery Saint Etienne. She uh, handled the sale and came back and told me the woman who bought it would like a copy of the View magazine, and I had managed to locate about five of them during the time we owned it. We still have one, and we now have a complete color photograph framed in the original View frame. I didn't sell it a frame. So the photograph, which looks exactly like this, unless you walked up to it, you wouldn't know that it isn't view. Uh, I have it now in its original frame, and hanging next to it is the View magazine, which is the magazine, this is the cover of the View magazine of that year. And so that's still in our home, and we'll never sell the View magazine, and nor would we sell the photograph. I don't know if there's another photograph of it or not. Um, well, the actual painting and View magazine, um, actually 14, I think it is, different um, copies of View magazine, which each have a different artist's work, many of the Surrealists, also Georgia O'Keeffe and Calder, um, they're on display in the Surrealist gallery. Uh, the, it, the View is on the display in the nudes section and the uh, View magazine, but actually we arranged it so when you're looking at the View magazine in your sight line, you can see the View painting. And I believe that Hirschfeld, although many artists were commissioned or asked to do the cover of View, generally they just had one of their works that already existed reproduced. I believe that Hirschfeld was the only one who made a painting. So he actually made a painting that says View and, and you know, on it, rather than just giving them a work and then having them overlay View, which I just think is, I didn't know that he then gave it to you. It's sort of a gift to you in the future when you yes. can deal with it. Yes, and I may be wrong about the frame. It may be that I actually sold it with its original frame. Do you remember, honey? What? I'm pretty sure we have the original. You think we have the original frame? I think so too. I'll have to take another look at it in, in the exhibit. It's interesting, anyway, just because of the way framing, the way he frames the word view, and I, I, I think this is an, an interesting painting in relation to borders and frames. But anyway, um, so this is a painting that was hung in, in my grandparents' house. So in Hirschfeld and Henriette, uh, Morris and Henriette Hirschfeld, um, and it hung over the couch, you told me. Uh, behind the couch, yeah, over the couch, essentially. And <clears throat> this is the painting that the Surrealists, that Marcel Duchamp and um, Andre Breton selected for the first papers of surrealism. So I'm, I'm figuring you weren't aware at the age of four years old that your grandfather was in this big surrealist show. I, we were taken, I was taken oh. to a couple of shows, uh, exhibits. I was very, very young, but I remember my mom taking me to some art galleries where he had exhibits. Did any of them have huge, like all this string, like this labyrinth of string? like shooting from the ceiling and 
I don't recall that, anything that was, like that. That was the first, it was in a mansion. I think you would remember the first papers of surrealism show. Here's the page um, in the catalog of, with this painting. But there, there's something about it being over the couch in your grandfather, the, the painter's house, and then being shown in this surrealist web of string and you know, with all of these dream visions that to me is, I don't know, there's not exactly a question here, except that it sort of seems like those two contexts or those two spaces should speak to each other. Somehow. You know, interestingly enough, I do remember that this was Aunt June's painting, even though it was hanging in the grandparents, grandparents house over the couch Huh. She lived in the house, in the apartment they lived in. Uh, it was always referred to as Jan, June, Aunt June's painting. And so that, did she then My grandfather must have given it to her, even though it belonged to the family uh, living there. So mm -hmm. I will say that last year in New York, this just, her, I mean, it was one of the most popular paintings in the, maybe the most, it was reproduced in a lot of the press. Roz Chast made a cartoon of this painting, um, which I tried to buy, but I, I couldn't afford it. Um, I mean, the original sketch. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. I'm sorry, this thing is a little counterintuitive. Okay, so I just wanted to end um, with this photograph, which is also in the beginning of the show. To, I don't know, does that look anything like what you remember of your grandfather painting? Uh, yeah, it looks exactly like my grandfather. Uh, there's a picture in the exhibit of him with a mustache. I had forgotten when he was much younger. I think this he has is white. One there. If it's a mustache, yeah. it's white. There's a black mustache. There's a painting called Artist and Model, and there's some speculation that he was painting himself as that artist. And I saw that black oh. mustache, and I said, No, that couldn't be him. He didn't have a black mustache. And then I got shown this and said, remember? And I know this photograph because I have it at home uh -huh. and it's framed at home. And, you know, he has the white mustache and as a younger man, he would have had it black. And there is one photograph that turned up that does have a picture of him uh -huh. with a black mustache. So artist and model, he must be the artist. Oh, that, that's sort of what... But he never had any nude models. I know that. Yes. Grandma, grandma would not have allowed that. Yes, and he told the press, what would the neighbors say? Were I to have a oh, young yeah, woman? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, but he didn't, I think once you told me he did not dress like this to paint. Oh, normally, no. He was yeah. never painting. His paint was slopped all over. I mean, he had this thing and, uh, no, he wouldn't have been in a suit to paint. And, and so this, as, as you this know. This is stage. This, yes, this is stage. The painting is completely finished and framed. There's no uh, paint on the palette. There's, you know, so this is the Museum of Modern Art before they had the show in 43, hiring a photographer to kind of create Hirschfeld as a legitimate. Yes, posed. Exactly, yeah. Posed. Um, so, and I always see in his face, and maybe this is projecting, but a little bit of like, what the hell is this? <laughs> So, um, wait, I, there might be one. Oh, that's it. So I think this is where we would like to hear from you. And any questions, especially for Bob, of course, um, would be welcome. Yes. Just really quickly, again, we'll hand off the mic. Two reminders, raise your hand, wait for the mic. And if you can speak, like point it at your mouth. That's great. And you'll be given the microphone so that I always hate it when they're doing an interview for the press and someone in the audience asks a question, and you don't know what it was, and the person is answering it, instead of repeating the question before answering it, and it drives me mad. Why don't you just repeat what they said? Yes, we need the microphone oh. over here. Oh, someone has it already? Yeah, I think he's dead yeah. then. Uh, how old was your grandfather when he came from Europe, and where did he come from? I have no idea how old he was. I understand he originally came from the Austrian-Hungarian border, if there is such a border. The, the Polish border near Germany, but it was Poland controlled by Russia at the time, and he was 18 years old when he arrived in the U.S. in 1890. And is there any influence of that background on the stuff that he 
Ms. Painter? You think? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the I question. I wonder whether there is any influence of, in, of that background on his paintings. No, I would have no idea. Understand that he passed away while I was still very young. My recollections are of him, not of his history or his background, because I knew nothing of it. Richard has done all the research that produced all the information on the history and the background. There is one picture that I have, which I believe is his father, oh. uh, which looks, of course, quite old, and, but I knew nothing about where that picture was taken or when. So uh, I'm not able to solve that mystery. There's a hand up here. Do we have the microphone? I was just wondering, when you were growing up, you must have seen your grandfather painted, and was there anybody else in the family that was, was interested in painting also? And yeah. I'll answer the question. He was self-taught, from what I understand, and where, does, where did his love for painting come from? Right. Uh, was there anybody, like his dad or, or any other member of the family who painted? That's why it kind of propel him to want to paint. As far as I know, and again, understanding I don't know the background to where he picked up painting, there was nobody else in the family who did any painting. The only one in the family that I knew of with talent was uh, my Uncle Kenny. And uh, Uncle Kenny could sing like a bird, but he couldn't paint birds. So uh, <laughs> I have no idea about where, what inspired him to paint. Uh, I believe it was a hobby he took up just once he was retired. And it was because of that hobby that, as I understand it, some painting was sitting somewhere that Sidney Janis saw it, one or two. And Sidney Janis fell in love with it and had the foresight to know that this was something more than more than games for a person at home to keep them busy. That's, I really can't answer anything else. Nobody else in the family. My sister sketched, and she did watercolors. And she was quite autistic sketching. And it just reminded me of that now. Uh, but that's it, she sketched dresses with people in them, ladies and them. So she did some sketching. I don't know what became of her sketches. And in watercolor. One last question. How many stars were there? <laughs> there were 19, it's in the book, right? Yeah. Is it 1900 and something? Almost, oh, how much? Maybe, yeah, 20, almost 3,000. According to my research assistant, if you believe her. <laughs> yeah, she didn't expect you to recount it at chat. <laughs> <laughs> I, believe it or not, you're on a mic and I can't hear you. Yes, I have my mouth. Hi, good evening. Hi. I'm very intrigued by the Moses and Aaron painting. And so there's a, it does, did he have a brother? Did what? Did your grandfather have a brother? Do you, do you think there's any kind of... I'm not, aware, there, of, I'm not aware of a brother at all. Okay. Um, he had Kenny as the son, June as the daughter. And uh, there was a brother, a what? Abraham, but I don't know because they had a shop together earlier in way before your grandfather. I knew nothing of that. I um, did not know that. But I wasn't able to find any information about Abraham whatsoever. So this painting is just so interesting the way they, they kind of, they're, they're present, but then, you know, that, that's Aaron kind of looks away. Mm hmm. The, the, the way they look at, well, kind of apart. Where mm -hmm. if you look at Coquette, she's kind of looking at you. She's, so she, she's trying to seduce you. Mm -hmm. So the, the way he depicted the vision, the, their sight lines or their, their visions, is, it's quite deliberate. So I was just wondering if there's kind of any family connection that they're, you know, I don't know, some sibling. <laughs> no, I, I, there's no connection that I'm aware of. I do know for a fact that if we look at Aaron, nobody in the family had a right hand attached to their left arm. If you notice. 
So I worked 11 years on a book called Master of the Two Left Feet. After it's done, Bob tells me, well, there are two right hands in this baby. <laughs> I, uh, this question actually is for Professor Meyer. Again, I can't hear. It's a the, question. The question is for Professor Meyer, if I could. I was just wondering how you discovered or rediscovered uh, Morris Hirschfield as an art historian. Yeah, I'm going to tell the story briefly because um, I, that's, yeah, a good idea, um, which is I knew the story that Alfred Bard, the founding director of MoMA, had been fired within two months of the Hirschfield, there was a Hirschfield one person show, extremely controversial. And some members of the board of trustees felt that Barr's support of this show, Sidney Janis curated it, um, had, had damaged the stature and, ta and had you know, tainted the taste level of the museum. That was not the only reason. The real reason had to do with trustees and money and so forth, <laughs> but that was one of the reasons given. I knew about that story, and it was supposed to be a section in my last book, which was a lot about Barr, but I didn't get to that section because I, I had to finish the book if I wanted this job at Stanford, and like, so out went the Morris Hirschfield section. Um, but then I saw Stage Beauties, and when I saw one of his paintings, I realized, wow, this artist goes so far beyond just this story about ba Alfred Barr. And so um, the only thing I'll say is when I decided that I wanted to write a book, the show came out of the book. It was several, about three years later after going into the book that I decided there should be a show because I'm not a curator um, or, you know, by anyway, um, I, I'm a, you know, we, we're supposed to write books. That's what we're supposed to do as academic art historians. But um, I told a friend who was an art historian that I was going to write a book on Morris Hirschfield. He said, a book? He said, I could see maybe an essay, but a whole book? And I said, yes, a book. And now we're not friends anymore. So. Could you possibly explain the center structure there in the Moses and Aaron? Is that something that you would see in a synagogue with the, the Ten Commandments with, I'm not sure what's on top of it, and then the two angels, and then the menorah? Is that? It? I can answer the question by a confession. The only time I went to synagogue was when my family wanted me to prepare for my bar mitzvah. And they insisted I learn Hebrew. And after a month of learning Bo, Ba, Ben, uh, which I guess is the alphabet, as I recall, I insisted I wasn't going to have a bar mitzvah if I had to do that. So we had a reform bar mitzvah. So I have, I have nothing to do with and no knowledge of what goes on, except once a rabbi caught friends in mine breaking into the sukkahs. That's where there's a holiday, and there's fruit hung uh, in this created room. And we went in to grab some fruit. And the rabbi saw us and chased me down the street. So I've been running away from religion ever since. And I used to be an agnostic, but I gave that up because there are no holidays for agnostics. Thank now, that doesn't answer your question, but it got us a few laughs. Other questions? Anything? The, the caption on the Aaron and Moses. Okay. Uh, it says Moses and Aaron, but uh, Moses is on the right and Aaron is on the left. Yes. And uh, uh, of course, Moses ran. Can't he? Nobody can hear. We need to speak. Of course, Moses outranked uh, Aaron. Right. But, uh, but 
if you were lining up the names with the figures, you might put uh, Aharon and Moses. No, in Judaism, you read from right to left. <laughs> I, yeah. Either way, you was able to tell. I, I, I'm, not, I'm just not sure that Morris Hirschfeld was quite that literary. You know, li literary. Li literal, I think we mean. Literal. Uh, maybe. I, I, I mean, um, and for example, there are two representations of the Ten Commandments in this painting, which is extremely, I think it's like unprecedented that you'd in one scene have two. And I read it as Moses is coming down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, and then they're in the Ark of the Covenant, and the, ten, the, the Aaron is being... Um, sanctified as the first prophet of the Israelites because Moses didn't want the job. He said, no, I'm not good at talking. You use my, my brother Aaron. So God said, okay. Um, but I, so I think that maybe that worked better, in, in, you know, to have Moses on the right. But um, I just don't believe that Hirschfeld, in my own, in, intuitively, that Hirschfeld would have been too concerned. It's not the caption, it's the title. The title. Yeah. No. No, he didn't. You're well, probably... the title, I, I'm standing by the fact that Moses is on the right. <laughs> he, he is wondering, I think, why it isn't named Aaron and Moses, because you see Aaron first and Moses second from left to right. right. But again, in Judaism, you read well, and that from is right Hebrew. to left. You would read Hebrew. the Ten Commandments, um, each one, you would read from right to left. Just one other thing about this. I search and sir, I don't know who gave the subtitle of delicious recoil. Never and I have heard of it. I have no idea what that means. It sounds very high mind, you know, it sounds very literary or something, but this is the first time I've seen it. You know, my mother produced a list, which I've given to Richard. Yeah. She listed every painting by a name that she gave it, and whether it was sold or not. And if it was sold to Janice, the amount it was sold to Janice for. And it's all in her writing. And uh, some were not sold at the time of that list. But Richard has a copy. I think of it. Up Delicious Recoil was added later. As a, I, It just sounds like a fancification. It's not but, something my mother would have right. named anything. <laughs> but I just want to say by way of closing that um, I'm very grateful to Gail and Bob. Um, but Bob as I mentioned, um, was, is for me this link to um, this artist and person that's become so important um, in my imagination and also in, in my life. And so I feel like we, I'm not part of the family, but we have a bond uh, th through caring well, about. Vicariously, you are a part <laughs> well, of the family. You. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, we're grateful to you too, Richard. Of course, it goes without saying because if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't all be sitting here now. Uh, well, it's thank true. you. But um, <laughs> I wanted to be thanking you and, and, and Gail, but um, so we'll, we'll, we thanked each other. But also, thank you for coming tonight. Please see the exhibition if you have, haven't, and you'll see many, several of the paintings um, that were projected here tonight. And um, yeah, I just think it's good to remember that art is made by people and people have lives. That isn't just about making art. A little plug for Richard. I understand he's going to do a book signing. Oh, I am. Yes. So as my mother says, I should say, I don't care if you read the book, just buy it. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, a little closing plug. If you want to buy it, the books right. will be for sale out in the lobby. Um, and Richard will be sitting right outside the entrance here to sign. We also have a, a related event on November 9th, um, Threading History, Jewish Americans, and the Garment Industry, and a couple of other great programs upcoming. So we hope oh, to see you again. You. Thanks again for coming tonight. Oh, don't worry about it.